Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are here with us today, and we'd love the chance to connect with you. So if you would, take a moment and click the link that's in this video description, or scan the QR code that will come up on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here worshiping with us and also tell us how we can be in prayer for you. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. Let's pray now together. Holy and loving God, we thank you that you know us fully. You see our hearts and know our desires, and we can't keep any secrets from you. In this time of worship, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts through the breath of your Holy Spirit so that we can perfectly love you and fully praise your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, King of my heart. Christ within me, Christ below me. Christ above me, never to part. Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ all around me, shield in the strife. Christ in my sleeping, Christ in my sitting, Christ in my rising, light of my life. Hello, I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. And it's my great privilege to lead us in our prayer today. As I pray, I'm going to be pausing during the prayer to give you an opportunity to speak the names of persons that you would especially like to lift up in prayer today. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Almighty God, Creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time you made us in your image. And in these last days, you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Let your Spirit ever renew our lives, and let your praises ever be on our lips. You promised to comfort us in our distress. You promised that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need fear no evil. You promised us your peace, which surpasses our ability to understand it. You have promised to be an ever-present help in time of trouble. And so we especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. And as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, so now we also pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now it's time for the children's message. And so if you have children or youth nearby who aren't already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over because I've got some things to share with them. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David and I'm going to be sharing the children's message today. Now, our pastor, Pastor Doug, is going to be reading scripture in a moment from one of the letters in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul wrote. Now you know what an apostle is, right? No, no, an apostle is not the husband of an epistle. No, no, a, an apostle in Bible days was someone who was kind of like a missionary and would, would go around and start churches and proclaim the good news of Jesus. And Paul was one of those apostles. and he would frequently write letters back to churches that he had started. And in those letters, he almost always talks about how much God loves those people and how much he loves and appreciates the people in those churches. So I want us to think for a few moments now about love. Now, I want you to imagine that this sheet of paper is, is love. This is the love that I have to give to others. Okay, and can you see how many corners there are? There's one, two, three, four corners, right? All right, now I'm going to give away some love. So I'm going to cut off one of the corners. All right, so I gave away some love. Now how many corners do I have? One, two, three, four, five. Whoa, I gave away some, but I have more. Well, let's see, if, let's see if that'll work again. All right, let me cut off another corner. All right, now let's count, uh, let's count the, the corners. How much love do I have left? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I've got six. I'm giving it away, but I have more. All right, let, let's try one more time and, and see how this works. So I'm going to give away another corner of love. And now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven corners. That's amazing, isn't it? The more that I give away, the more that I have. And, you know, that's just the way love is. The more that you give away, the more you have because you can never give it all away. And do you see what's, what's happening here as I continue to give away love? If I keep giving it away, eventually it's going to be round like a circle. And a circle is round. It has no beginning and no end. And that's the way love is. You can never give it all away. And no matter how much you give away, you've always got plenty left to keep giving and keep giving and keep giving. So I want you to think about that as you live your life, as you interact with your family, with your friends at school, your friends in the neighborhood, um, people that, other people that you know, always be loving. Always be loving because you can't give it all away. You can't give all the love away. And that reminds us that all love comes from God. The Bible tells us that God is love. And God loves us and loves us and loves us. Let's pray together. 
Lord God, we thank you that you do love us and that we can never, ever give away all of our love. No matter how much we give, there's always some more. I pray, Lord, that you will bless the children and youth and, and their families that are watching this video, that are part of our church, our community. Bless them, O oh Lord, and we give you thanks for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I'm so glad you took the time today to watch The Vine, our online campus here at Wrightsville. Today we begin a new series um, that we're going to talk about um, throughout the summer. And so um, we're going to just dive right in. We're going to begin with the first letter of uh, Paul to the Thessalonians. And um, we're going to read through the first 10 verses of the first chapter. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, also known as Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath of that is coming. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you wrote to the early church through letters. Write to us today on our hearts. Speak to us anew. And may we hear your word proclaimed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned, today we kick off a new series for the summer where we look at the books of the New Testament that were originally written as letters or sometimes called epistles. They're a fascinating glimpse into the early church as Christianity was just being formed. Now, these letters are a little longer than the ones that you and I might write in a modern card or certainly by email, but most can be read in less than an hour. Today we're talking about 1 Thessalonians which is generally considered the first letter written in all of the New Testament. The whole letter can, like I say, be read in less than an hour, maybe less than half an hour. And you could do that before bed or out on the beach or while listening to it in the car. And I hope you'll read these letters each week to get a fuller understanding of the concerns that were facing the New Testament churches. Now, I will say that if you're like me, your mind can start to wonder, not wander, although that sometimes happens too, but in this case, I mean wonder. I wonder, what caused the writer to write this letter in the first place? Sometimes that can be pretty obvious based on the content of the letter, but it does make you wonder, what are the conflicts or the problems like in some of these churches? Also, after receiving these letters, how did the churches respond? Did they shape up? Did they change? Did they take these words to heart? Generally speaking, we don't really know. But we do learn a lot from these letters. What was important to the church and what should be important to the church now? In 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul introduces a concept that he will repeat in nearly every one of his letters. In my sermon title, I called them the three fundamental virtues. Others have called them the pillars of the Christian faith. Still others have described them as the marks of a Christian. 
They are three words that we use over and over and over again. They are faith, hope, and love. Next week, Pastor Julia is going to explore the first letter to the Corinthians, where Paul writes that faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. That's probably the most well-known combination of these words in Scripture. But it isn't the only time, not by a long shot. For instance, in the first, letter of, uh, excuse me, the first chapter of Colossians, Paul writes, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because He's heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, and about which you've already heard the true message of the gospel. And in the fifth chapter of Romans, he writes, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, in character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. But this trinity of Christian values, it is first used by Paul in today's scripture. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love. Let's start with faith. By faith, Abraham was justified. By faith, Moses demanded before the king to let my people go. By faith, Jesus said, we're able to move mountains. By faith, the apostle Paul said, we are justified too. All of this by faith. There's no other way for us to come to God. We cannot reach Him by our works, in that we have failed. By faith we come, and then we learn about hope and love. When we believe that God has loved us in Christ, it's then we are free to love others. There can be no loving action in Christianity without at least a mustard seed size worth of faith. True faith will produce real love. We must first ask ourselves, though, do we have faith? Ken Davis, a youth pastor, has a way of discovering whether someone actually does have faith. In his book, How to Speak to Youth, he tells of a college lesson he had to prepare for his speech class. He says, we were to be graded on our creativity and ability to drive home a point in a memorable way. The title of my talk, he says, was The Law of the Pendulum. I spent 20 minutes carefully teaching the physical principle that governs, governs a swinging pendulum. The law of the pendulum is this. A pendulum can never return to a point higher than the point from which it was released. Because of friction and gravity, when the pendulum returns, it will fall short of its original release point. Each time it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until finally it is at rest. This point of rest is called the state of equilibrium, where all forces acting on the pendulum are equal. Ken then attached a three-foot string to a child's toy and uh, secured it to the top of a blackboard with a thumbtack. He pulled the top to one side and made a mark on the blackboard where he let it go. Each time it swung back, a new mark was made. It took less than a minute for the top to complete its swinging and come to rest. And when he finished the demonstration, the markings on the blackboard had proven his thesis. He says, I then asked how many people in the room believed the law of the pendulum was true. Every one of my classmates raised their hands, including the teacher. So he started to walk to the front of the room, most people thinking the class was over. In reality, it had just begun. For hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room, he had fashioned a large, crude, but functional pendulum, about 250 pounds of metal weights tied to four strands of 500-pound test parachute cord. He then invited the instructor to climb up on a table and sit in a chair with the back of his head against the wall. He brought the 250 pounds of metal up to his nose and holding the huge pendulum just a fraction of an inch from his face, he let it go. 
Once again, he explained the law of the pendulum to the teacher, who had applauded only moments before, if the law of the pendulum is true, then when I release this mass of metal, it will swing across the room and return short of the release point. Your nose will not be in any danger. And then he looked him in the eye and said, Sir, do you believe this law is true? There was a long pause. Huge beads of sweat are forming on the teacher's upper lip, and he whispered, Yes. The pendulum started to make a swishing sound as it crossed the room. And at the far end of its swing, it paused momentarily and started back. Ken said he never saw a man move so fast in his life. He, the teacher literally dove from the table. Deftly stepping around the pendulum, Ken asked the class, Does the teacher believe in the law of the pendulum? And the students resounded by saying, No. Faith is Simon Peter stepping out on turbulent waters. Faith is the centurion proclaiming, Lord, merely say the word and I know that he will be healed. Faith is Matthew turning his back on riches and security and tossing his future to the wind to let Christ be his guide. All these dangers coming at us like a pendulum. Do we step out of the way or do we face them with faith? Faith is not more important than love, but faith is a prerequisite to love. We will never love until we have a predisposition that convinces us that love is worthwhile. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Next is hope. Hope has received bad press over the years. I always think of that song in the Rodgers and Hammerstein's um, musical South Pacific that says, I'm stuck like a dope on a thing called hope. That's how some people view it. Hope is for the simple and silly-minded. We relegate it to the same arena as wishful thinking. If you ask someone if they're going to be at a meeting, so often the answer you get is, I hope so, meaning probably not. But hope is so much more fundamental than that. We cannot possibly make it in life without hope. Look in the faces of the abject poor, of those with serious drug addictions, of those who use violence to get what they want and you will see hopelessness. Said the psalmist centuries before the birth of our Savior, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my confidence, since the days of my youth. Do you remember the story of Pandora's box from Greek mythology? The lovely Pandora was sent by Zeus to be the bride of... I can never remember how to say this word. Epimetheus. Epimetheus. Right? Epimetheus. One of Pandora's more endearing charms was her curiosity. But that quality also proved to be nearly her undoing. One day, Mercury, the messenger, sent a box to the young couple. It was meant for them to enjoy, but under no circumstances were they supposed to open it. Well, of course, it's the old story of the forbidden fruit. Told that she could not do it, it became the thing she wanted to do the most. So one day, Pandora pried it open and peeked inside. Suddenly out flew swarms of insects that began attacking the couple. Both lovers were stung with the poison of suspicion, hatred, fear, and malice. And now the once happy couple began to argue. Epimetheus became bitter and Pandora wept with a broken heart. But in the midst of the quarreling, they heard a tiny voice cry out, Let me out to soothe your pain. And fearfully they opened the box again. And this time a beautiful butterfly flew out. It touched the couple. And miraculously, their pain was healed and they were happy again. The butterfly, we're told, was hope. It's hope that sustains us. Hope that soothes our pain. In my way of thinking, there's a big difference between just any funeral and a Christian funeral. A funeral can be nothing more than a eulogy. The theme is the deceased. But the theme in the Christian funeral is hope. We are God's Easter people. We have this wonderful hope that cannot be destroyed, even by the enemy of death. You know, when Noah floundered for days and days upon the endless waters, it appeared all was lost. But then one day he released a dove, and the dove returned with an olive branch. And I suggest to you that the bird represented hope. And it was hope that kept Noah and his family moving on. The last of the great Christian virtues is love. Many of you will recognize the name of Elie Wiesel, the renowned Jewish theologian and prolific author. 
We quote from him every year at our annual patriotic service. In his book, All Rivers Run to the Sea, he tells of his family living in Hungary during the dark days of World War II. His family was waiting for their time to come for the Nazis to arrive at their door and take them to a labor camp. He tells about a peasant woman by the name of Maria. Maria was almost like a member of the family. She was a Christian. During the early years of the war, she continued to visit them, but eventually non-Jews were no longer allowed entrance into the Jewish neighborhoods that were called ghettos. That did not deter Maria. She found her way through the barbed wire. She came anyway, bringing the vassals fruit, vegetables, and cheese. And one day she came knocking at their door. It was a cabin that she had up in the hills, and she wanted to take the children, of which Ellie was one, and hide them before the SS came to get the family. They decided after much debate to stay together, although they were deeply moved by this gesture. He writes later of her, Dear Maria, if other Christians had acted like you, the trains rolling toward the unknown would have been less crowded. If priests and pastors had raised their voices, if the Vatican had broken its silence, the enemy's hand would not have been so free. But most thought only of themselves. A Jewish home was barely empty of its habitants before they descended like vultures. He goes on to say, I think of Maria often with affection and gratitude, he writes, and with wonder as well. This simple, uneducated woman stood taller than the city's intellectuals, their dignitaries, and their clergy. My father had many acquaintances and even friends in the Christian community. Not one of them showed the strength of character of this peasant woman. Of what value was their faith, their education, their social position, if it did not arouse their love? It was a simple and devout Christian woman who saved the town's honor. Friends, how often do we concentrate on the pedantic rather than the profound? If we do not go forth from worship to love people, to extend a helping hand, to show mercy, to offer compassion for those who are hurting, then what are we really about? Take away faith, hope, and love? And all we have is a pretty building. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we love because you first loved us. Lord, give us faith for this day and for tomorrow. Give us hope that things will get better for our own lives and the people in the world around us. And help us to be your instruments, spreading love so that others might have faith and hope as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. May you have faith for today, hope for tomorrow, and love forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. Thank you.